All right, well, thank you very much, and thanks everybody for turning up today. Uh, my name is John Arnrich, and the next speaker will be Gary Nicholson. Uh, Locus Limited is a valuated reseller based in Auckland, New Zealand. We've been partners with SAFE coming up 10 years now, and it's a relationship that we really value. Uh, it's important to us, and, and we think that uh, it's, it's important to SAFE as well. Uh, we've been very fortunate over the last 10 years to have been pretty successful, and one of the things that we want to do in relation to that is give back to our community. So our talk today is about uh, Oxfam and how we are doing uh, some uh, pro bono work, which I think is a term that we use up here in North America. Uh, just to, to make, it's not so much of our time, um, but it can make a heck of a difference. So I'm going to pass you over to Gary, who's going to go through the technical aspects of how we're doing what we are doing. Uh, but I just wanted to say, Chris Hadfield yesterday in his keynote talked about everybody, uh, every company taking on board an opportunity to give back to education and and what you can do. So on that theme, and this is why we actually had this talk, is our challenges for people who are in the FME community to see what you can do to give back to the community as well and to enrich and help the lives of other people. Uh, and we think Oxfam is such a cool organisation to be involved with who do so much good. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, Gary Nicholson from Locust Limited. He's a FME certified professional. Gary, take it away. Thanks, John. So briefly about Oxfam Trial Walker. It's a fundraising event for Oxfam. It's their major, major fundraising event for the year. In New Zealand, they hope to raise a million dollars every year. They don't quite get to that, but they come pretty close. I think this year, that's around $850,000. The idea is you get teams of four together to walk 100 kilometers in 36 hours, or 50 kilometres in 18 hours. There's about 17 of these events around the world, and I've been helping out with the New Zealand one for about 10 years now. Uh, two years ago, they moved from Taupo, which is in the centre of the North Island, out to Bay of Plenty. So we had a brand new course, and it's really lovely out there. And I've gradually introduced FME more and more over the last 10 years. So I'm going to go through some of the uses for FME in Trail Walker. Uh, elevation profile creations, kilometre marker creation. The main part of the talk is going to be about TWAC, which is a system I've developed to track the teams using Twitter. And then there's a dashboard as well I created this year. So prior to the event, they go out and walk the course and record GPS locations of the course. They send that data to me and they want to be able to put an elevation profile up on their website to hopefully not scare the people off too much. But as you can see there, there's a great big hill in the middle of the course. And the first year they did the new trail, there were two huge hills in the middle of the course and there was a weather bomb during the event too. It was a real nightmare. So they, a lot of people said they're not <coughs> going to come back. The course is just way too hard. So this year they went out and changed the course slightly. So they wanted a new elevation profile. So I get the GPS data from them. I do a lot of tidying up because they're not GIS people and data's in a bit of a mess when I get it. So I use FME to tidy up the data and then do a fairly simple overlay of the course with a DEM I just download from I think the government website a point on raster value extractor to create a CSV file of the elevation profile they had the tools already to do that the actual plot of the elevation, so they just wanted a CSV file they could load into Excel. So I did that about three or four months prior to the event. And also, once they got the course finalised, use FME to figure out where the kilometre 
markers go. So every kilometre there's a marker that the participants come across. So they can see how far along the course they are, how far to go. And that plays an integral role in the Twitter thing I'll get to later. So I have to figure out where those kilometre points go. So there's a process here. A lot of it is just tidying up the data. The main work of figuring out where the kilometres are is done by a snipper transformer. So split it into one kilometre segments and then get the end of those segments and create a point there which I then save as a GPX file for download into their GPSs which we also supply. So two days before the event the trail marking team will go out with the GPSs and will get shown where to put these markers. So as the teams walk along they'll see these markers and tweet of where they are. So if you read this tweet here, at 7pm, the one on the right, 7pm trial, trail walker to the hashtag 50 kilometre, 50k to go, hashtag OTWNZ. So about three or four years ago, we wanted a way to track the teams affordably. I have a vehicle tracking business as well, and I could have supplied the teams with GPS trackers, but there's 300 teams at, say, $100 per tracker. What's that? 30000 We do do this pro bono. We can't afford $30,000 to give the teams, and the teams don't really want to spend $100 either, and that's $30,000 that comes out of Oxfam's bottom line, so teams are starting to use Twitter as well out there, so I thought let's see if I can use Twitter to track where the teams are going. They've got all the phones, they're using Twitter, I can use FME to track them using that. So if you look at that tweet, there's two important things there. There's the hashtag OTWNZ, which is a hashtag for the event, and the 50km. So I figured I could use the tweet searches to search for any tweets with that hashtag, and then pull out that 50 kilometer marker from the tweet, and turn that into a coordinate, and put it onto the map. And the end result is on each team page has got a map of the course and wherever they send a tweet, the marker shows up on there. This particular guy, is this the one where he had three girls? Mike's done the trail walker almost as many times as me, or in fact even more times than me. And he's really into his tweets, he tries to get the tweet out every single kilometre. Any gaps there are simply because there's no cell phone coverage. So he's a really good one to show. So he goes along and tweets every single kilometre. So his supporters can see how far, how well they're going by the tweets on the map. So nothing more than his cell phone and the tweets, and we turn into a live tracker. And we had about half the teams using this system. So I'll show you how I get that to work. So again, the hashtag OTWNZ, either 20km or hashtag 20 to get the distance, and FME does the work. So I automate this by having a control workspace which runs another workspace every two minutes. And the way I automate this is a trick that some people haven't heard of before. I just use a creator transformer to create a whole bunch of features and then pass them through a decelerator which only allows one feature to go through every two minutes and then that goes into a workspace runner which runs the main workspace. So I could have done it with a scheduled task or FME server but this is the way I did it, it's nice and simple. 
and I just leave that control workspace running all weekend. Now down the bottom is the main workspace. So once that gets run with a workspace runner, I use a tweet searcher to search for any recent tweets with the hashtag OTWNZ. And also create a Twitter list just prior to the event. I get a list of who's using the, the system and what their Twitter handles are. So I turn that into a Twitter list. So I also search for any tweets on that list because just in case people forget to use the OTWNZ hashtag, I'll also get their tweets from that list. Uh, so the tester there is to just get tweets during the event. So if people have been testing prior to the event, I don't really want those on the map. So I've got a tester to just give me tweets that are during the event. Then use regular expression transformers to search for the various ways the distance can be written either the hashtag 20 or 20 km or 20 space km. I think there are three ways you can specify a distance. And then once I've got the distance out of the regular expression, I use the attribute value mappers to assign latitude and longitudes. So I've got a list there, every kilometre mark, what's its latitude and longitude. And then I save that to an SQL database. Next stage is take all the tweets for the users and do some formatting, KML formatting, because the end result is a KML file. Uh, any 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometre positions, get a special icon, the rest are just a plain red icon, and output a KML file per Twitter user. And to make that available over the internet to go onto their team page, all I'm doing is saving it to Dropbox, letting Dropbox sync that up into the Dropbox public folder, and then it's available for everyone to use. So go back to the map. Yep. So the JavaScript behind this map just automatically refreshes every few minutes, gets that latest KML file. So as people tweet within two or three minutes, this map will automatically update and show their latest position. And that's been running successfully for the last couple of years. They do have a dedicated app now that's been developed for this last year, which I'll integrate on that map as well. That also sends GPS positions every five minutes, I think. So next year I'll be integrating that application as well, which will probably reduce the need for this, but it served the purpose quite well. And some people are still keen to use their Twitter. Now this year, as well as looking at the maps to see where the teams were going, uh, the Oxfam control staff wanted an easy way to see how teams were going through the checkpoints. See how many teams are retired, how many teams are still to go. And they asked me to do it. They first asked me around October the event's in March, and I said, yeah, no problem. I'll, I've got plenty of time to do that. Of course, two days before the event, they asked me how I was going with it, and yeah, I hadn't started yet. So literally, I only spare time was the Thursday night. I had about two spare hours to get this going, and luckily for me, came to the rescue. So over a cup, couple of beers, I was able to take the timing system, so we've developed the check-in, check-out system as well. It runs on laptops, which we also supplied. As the teams come in, 
they get scanned in and get scanned out and goes up to our servers and the database and we've got web pages here to display all that information. And luckily there's a web service I already had built in behind this, which this page uses, so it's fairly easy to use FME to access that web service. So it did make it possible to get this running reasonably quickly. So over a couple of years, I started out with getting the data from that timing web service page, just using, I think it was an XML reader, just pointed it to the web service. Then I have a look through the data to see if there's any teams that have completely retired. If you look back at this information on the right here, we've got those A, B, C, D, that's where people have pulled out at a particular checkpoint. So first I go through and see if there's a team that have got four retirements in there and are no longer walking and figure out which checkpoint they completely retired at. Then third stage is to set a checkpoint status so team can either have gone to a checkpoint and carried on, which would be complete. They've arrived at a checkpoint but haven't left yet. They've retired at a checkpoint or they've not arrived at all. So the four different statuses and I assign a, that status to an attribute. And for each of the seven checkpoints, do a statistics Summary, give me a count of all of those four different statuses. And set a colour based on the status. So then I can use the charting in FME to generate pie charts for each of those. Create a file name for each of the checkpoints and save the eight, seven charts to PNGs. Again, I'm using Dropbox to make it available on the web. It's just nice and simple. Just point it to a folder. Dropbox can do everything else from there. Uh, then create a summary table and an HTML page and save that to Dropbox as well. So that process did literally only take about two hours to get running. If I tried to program it from scratch using some of the other tools I've got, it would have taken me a week or two. But Luckily I was able to get this going and the end result was this. So the HTML page that I generated just used an automatic refresh in there so it refreshed itself every minute or two. And we've got a summary table of how many teams are in each checkpoint. So this is obviously at the end of the event. So all the teams have finished apart from three I think pulled out. So during the event, that was changing colours every two minutes as teams came through checkpoints. And they were really happy to see this working. It was working by the end of the event. It did need a few tweaks to fix some silly mistakes during the event. But we got, got there in the end, and it should be a lot better for next year. But it's a lot easier than going through that spreadsheet and seeing how many teams were still to go. So thanks for it for me. But next year, I'm not going to leave it till the last minute to do some improvements. But <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> but again, with FME, it's still be quick to make these. I'm going to use FME Cloud, and this is a perfect example for FME Cloud. You can power it up for the event. They only need it for the weekend. We fire up an instance, maybe on the Wednesday get it all running, turn it off on the Monday. It's not going to cost them much at all. It's got this absolutely perfect use case for FME Cloud. So i would use that instead of automating it through a desktop the way I did with the decelerator. And I won't need to use Dropbox. Just do FME Cloud doing everything. 
I need to add some smarter logic to deal with missed check-ins and check-outs. Sometimes the check-in systems run by volunteers, so I try to make it as idiot-proof as possible, but they do miss people. And so I do need to say, make it logical enough so that if someone has checked out of a checkpoint, but the system hasn't got them checking in, then they must have checked in. So I didn't need to add some logic for that. Uh, I need to add some warning about overdue teams. If a team is, should have been at that checkpoint and they haven't turned up yet, then I could use the notification services to send out emails or tweets or something to warn people that there may be teams overdue. Most of the time they've just missed a check-in and check-out, but we do need to look at how we can track that. Sometimes they will retire during a leg and forget to tell anyone they have retired. Uh, I'll use the HTML reporter transformer to do the reports rather than just doing it manually. Uh, as I said, look how notification services could be integrated. There's plenty of scope to use those here. And I won't leave it till two days before the event, but I probably will. <laughs> so I'll leave John to finish off. Well, thanks, Gary. Um, the, the, the message is about, you know, using that expertise that you've got as FME professionals, just to give a little bit back to the communities that we're all part of. And I think everybody, I think Chris again said yesterday that we're all extremely lucky, uh, the people that were in the room yesterday, and I just can't, uh, I just have to agree 100%. We're all really, really fortunate people, and sometimes maybe we just forget that just a little bit. So when you've got a guy like Gary, uh, with his skills and his ability, with a piece of technology like FME, if you put those two things together, you can achieve uh, a, a terrific outcome in a short period of time. So I really encourage people just to step back for a moment, maybe have a wee think about something that's happening in your community and what can you do using your skills, using FMA. And we've heard all week about how safe, are so happy to assist in these kind of ventures in terms of providing software. So there's no excuses, we can do something. And as I say, really, really encourage you to, to have a think how you can give back and how you can do something. And uh, Honestly, uh, giving is better than receiving, and it's lovely to get the feedback from Oxfam. They've raised 800 odd thousand dollars. We've got a little part to play in that, and it's a very proud part. So thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you very much. Um, so does anyone have any questions about this project for um, John or Gary? <laughs> I'd like to know just what brand of beer you drink. And um, B, uh, you, you, you're moving on to, you're saying next year that you're going to, instead of using Twitter, I, I'm sort of thinking that you're going to do like NMEA data over radio or something. Is that the plan? This year they hired a company from Christchurch who builds Android and iPhone apps specifically for events. And part of what they do in that app is to send the GPS starter off to a server, and part of my vehicle tracking business takes that GPS data, so I integrated that with their app. Oh, so it's using a specific event app. Yeah, that. Uh, what, oh, being from New Zealand, there's plenty of craft beers, but actually one of my favorites is Blue Moon. Oh. That's from the States, so, but yeah, plenty of craft beers to choose from. Uh, this was their 12th year. I got involved after the third event. So when I came along, the check-in, check-out system was all just done through Excel spreadsheets. And the data was getting sent back to after the event just on a USB stick. So my first step was to automate sending the spreadsheets back via FTP. And then each year, just gradually improved, developed my own timing system app, 
used FME more. It's just gradually got more involvement. So do you share this with other, you said there's 14 in Pakistan. I think there's 17, yeah. There's 17 events over 11 countries, I think. No, they, most other Oxfams do it in-house. But New Zealand, Oxfam's too small. They don't really have the skills. It doesn't seem to be much sharing of technology between them. I think this year I'm going to try and get over to the Sydney event and see how they do things and do some knowledge sharing. But at the moment it's just specifically for New Zealand. I did look at that originally, and I could add that as well. Nobody really has it turned on. Okay, I was going to say, you could, obviously the device isn't even enabled, mm -hmm. you could fall back. Yeah, I've got a feeling I may actually be using it. I can't, I'd have to go look at the workspace, but I've got a feeling if it's there, I use that instead of the kilometre market, but not many people use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.